It was a painful and slow awakening. An ember of pain was smoldering in the back of my head, throbbing every now and then to remind me of what had happened in the motel. My body felt far away, as if there were miles between my head and my arms and legs. Everything was slowed, every reaction, every feeling, until I opened my eyes. Once I did, I came to a horrifying realization. I knew what I was looking at, our living room, our home. My body jumped into overdrive, forcing me to move past pain and disorientation and regain control. I tried to stand, but it was only then that I realized that I was in fact sitting down. There was something tying my wrists together and pinning them behind my back. My ankles were tied to the legs of the chair so tightly that I couldn't feel my feet. Being tied to a chair that my parents had given your mother and me for our wedding in our own home stirred the anger inside of me to proportions I never thought possible. My heart pounded, stoking the flaming pain in the back of my head. I felt like I couldn't possibly become any angrier. Then I turned around and saw you. You were tied up, sitting in a dining room chair that was so large that they had to leave your legs untied. Your eyes were closed, and you were slumped over, your head hanging unnaturally. I tried to call out to you, and it was then that I realized that there was something wrapped around my mouth, looping around the back of my head several times. Duct tape, probably the same kind they'd used to tie my wrists and ankles. Probably taken from our garage. The bastards. And just as Chuck's face flashed across my mind, reminding me of who I had to thank for our current predicament, the asshole himself walked in front of me. He waved almost apologetically. I strained against the chair, trying to rip my way out of the restraints and throttle him. But they were wrapped too tightly. So tightly, in fact, that the numbness in my hands and feet was tinged with spikes of freezing and boiling pain. The circulation had been cut. How long had I been out? It had to be at least an hour, maybe two. I shot a look at your tiny hands. They were a red so deep it was almost purple. You could suffer nerve damage. You could lose one hand or both. All because our neighbors had stooped so low as to tie an unconscious ten-year-old to a chair. I turned to look at Chuck, making sure my eyes conveyed the hatred that was burning its way through my veins. Chuck held up his hands. This isn't my fault, he said, his voice a pathetic, skittish thing. It made us do it. You think you have it rough? You haven't even bled yet. You haven't made your own family bleed. Chuck made his way over to the dining room table. I followed him, keenly aware of the fact that he had a knife in one of his hands. I almost choked on my own spit when I saw it. There on the table next to a toolbox and several rolls of duct tape was a white board game. There were two pieces on the board and three laying outside of it, toppled like surrendered kings in chess. I was pretty sure that Chuck had three children. I can't roll again until my wife gets back, Chuck muttered without turning around. Trust me, if I could make this go any faster, I would. I'm almost at the finish line. Oh, I almost forgot. Chuck ignored my muffled questions and walked out of the room. I shot another look at your hands. They were already purple. Mine felt like yours looked. I heard Chuck's grunts before I saw him walk back into the room. I knew that sound. The sound someone makes when they're carrying something heavy. And then I saw it. A glass surface that caught the light. There was a black plastic frame around it, as well as a slot big enough to insert a VHS into. Our TV. He set it down in front of me, leaving it unplugged. And now we wait, Chuck said, walking over to the dining room table. We didn't have to wait long. Maybe ten minutes later, the telltale pop of a TV turning on sounded off. A white flash fired across the screen and a picture began crackling into existence. It was a man wearing a gray suit and sitting behind a massive desk. Behind him was a dark background with a lit up sign. The second I read it, my breath caught in my throat. It said, You News. Welcome and good evening, the anchorman said. His voice was buttery smooth and rich as chocolate. He smiled as he spoke, pearly white and friendly. Tonight we continue our coverage into the life of a seemingly normal wife and mother. We go to the live footage. The anchorman shifted slightly in his seat as a picture-in-picture -picture transition was applied to the live broadcast. A rectangle of video footage appeared next to him. It showed a car driving down a suburban street. Our suburban street. I recognized the car too. 
Chucks. We're getting reports that right now Mrs. Lily, redacted, is on her way to her home. She isn't driving the car, but is instead lying in the back seat, hands tied behind her back. The anchorman smiled after that, like he was pleasantly relaying some good news. Through the television screen, I watched the car move up my own driveway. My heart was beating faster and faster, knowing that your mother was in the back seat, knowing that her hands were tied, knowing that she would soon be joining us for whatever these psychopaths had planned. The front door opened, and the anchorman started talking again. According to our sources, Mrs. Redacted walked into the room. And just as the voice on the TV said, your mother walked into the room, my Lily. Her hands were still tied behind her back, and her mouth was taped shut. One look at her eyes was all it took. They were wide, full of tears and shooting nervously between you and me. I began to sob. Chuck's wife was behind Lily, pushing her along gently. Her nose was missing, in its place only a gaping wound. There were others like it on her arms and legs, like someone had taken a knife to her at random. There was nothing in her hands, no gun, no knife. So why was your mother going along with this? Authorities believe that the sequence of events played out as follows, the anchorman said, an unmistakable tinge of glee in his voice. Mrs. Redacted walked over to the kitchen, opened the top drawer, and pulled out the largest knife. Lily's eyes widened. I knew that look. I'd seen it in the war, but I'd never seen it on her. The worst kind of fear. Not fear of others, not fear for what might befall you, but fear for what might happen to someone you care about. Then she started walking, almost casually, to the kitchen. I screamed at her to stop, to try to get away, but it came out muffled and panicked and pathetic. Here we are, prisoners in our own homes, being forced to do things against our will, and it was about to get much worse. As Lily stepped into the kitchen, Chuck's wife walked up behind her, grabbed a knife off the dining room table, and cut the duct tape around your mother's wrists. Lily could have ran. She could have tried to grab the knife or one of the other tools on the dining room table. Instead, she kept walking. She wasn't in a daze. Not quite. I could see the terror and confusion on her face. She was aware of what she was doing, and she was horrified by it. Lily walked up to the drawer where we kept the knives. Don't. Don't do it. Don't listen. But she couldn't hear me. She opened the drawer, the lights on the ceiling reflecting off the knives, and hit her in the face. She reached out and touched one, almost as if she were curious, like she had never seen a knife before. Then she pulled it out of the drawer and held it in her trembling hands. Forensic specialists stated that Mrs. Redacted walked back into the kitchen, the murder weapon in her hand. Lily's feet began to move. There was some hesitation this time, as if she was fighting an invisible strain that was pulling her forward. I could see her straining with every fiber of her being, trying to hold herself back. Whatever struggle was going on inside of her, Lily, our, our Lily, lost. According to the medical examiner, Mrs. Redacted attacked her son first, the anchorman said. She began walking towards you, the sharp edge of the knife moving ever so slightly closer to your skin. I screamed, the tape around my mouth reducing my pleas to muffled grunts. And she kept walking, getting closer. Her body was stiff, moving unnaturally. I knew how she walked. I knew how she moved. That wasn't her. Her eyes were wild, filled with tears, shooting in every direction as if trying to find something. Anything that could help her. She was still in there. You shouldn't listen to this. Nobody should listen to this. She lifted the knife. Her hand was stiff, robotic. I thought it was all over. All she had to do was plunge it down and you'd be hurt beyond your saving. I was immensely aware of the other people in the room, of the man on the TV, watching, waiting. Bastards. Damn bastards. The autopsy revealed that Mrs. Redacted stabbed her only son 25 times in the face, chest, throat, and stomach. There was a sick glee in the anchorman's voice as he said it. Lily's eyes widened. I could see her reacting to those words, knowing that she would never do that to you, but also knowing that she might not have a choice. The knife began moving down. Its progress was slow. Her hand was shaking as if caught in an invisible tug of war. 
It was moving closer and closer, inches away from your right cheek. Then she looked at me. I wish there had been fewer tears so I could have seen her eyes clearly. I've spent years playing that expression in the back of my head again and again, trying to find meaning there. I don't know for sure, but I think she was saying sorry. Please don't listen to this. Please don't. She lifted the knife again. The movement smoother this time. She plunged. She cut. She... If what we read about in the article was true, you News was somehow able to make people do things they would have otherwise never even dreamed of doing. It had that power, like all the other articles only your mother could read. I want you to remember that. To remember its perverse power, its ungodly way of corrupting people. Because your mother was special. She was the strongest person I've ever met. Because you News didn't work on her. She beat it in the end. Lily pointed the knife away from your skin and towards hers. That's all I'll say. After she... After it was done, the anchorman emitted a shriek, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It was like the mad warble a radio might make if you submerge it underwater. Then he was gone. Static exploded across the TV screen and out through its speakers. It took me a few seconds to realize that we were now alone in the room. There was no sign of Chuck or his wife. No sign of the guest board game on the dining room table either. I moved without thinking and ran towards your mother. It was too late. I tried anyway. I, I grabbed a towel from the kitchen and tried to stop the bleeding. I pulled her closer to our phone and used it while still plugging the wound. There was blood. Too much blood. But there was something else too. Black smoke, thick and springy, flowing out of your mother's nose and mouth. I held my breath until it was gone. I hoped you didn't breathe any of it in. It didn't occur to me until days later that the ropes tying you and me to the chairs had disappeared, along with Chuck and his wife. You woke up when the paramedics were loading your mother into the back of the ambulance. You tried to run to her, but I stopped you. You scratched at me, kicked me, bit me, but I held you in place. I don't know if I should have. I don't know if that made you hate me more or less. I don't have anything else to write. I'm out of words. My mother committed suicide when I was little. It's something I don't really tell people. Usually I just say that she passed away. Most people don't pry. The few that do get in, I don't want to talk about it from me. I never understood why. Every time I picture my mother, I see her smiling. She was that kind of person. She somehow knew when you had a bad day, even if you tried to hide it. So it never made much sense to me. It still doesn't. If I had known when I started documenting these events on here that I would write about the real reason behind my mother's death, I would have never started. This one hit too close to home. The fact that she didn't want to, that she did it to save me, makes it better. I'm still processing it. I'll keep writing, with more consistency this time. The hard part is done. The part I've been dreading since I first read this entry. Well, one of the hard parts anyway. Thank you for sticking around. I'll post again soon.